Greetings, ladies and gentle players. It's another wonderful Friday this February of 2022, making it a wonderful day for basics. And you're already probably confused because I've got a T-Learn game up. T-Learn? What? Shibano Toromaru? Am I reviewing one of his games for basics? No, not quite. You see, it was brought to my attention that I haven't gone over the basics of basics in a very long time. A fact that was rather news to me. I thought I had just put out a video uh, detailing what basics are. Yeah, the last time I put out a video was in fact in 2017. Mm -hmm. It was called Fundamentals Basic Basics Lecture Go Lecture, May 30th, 2017. And that was the last time I kind of went over the basic ideas of uh, Go, which was strange. Very, very strange. It's been like almost five years now. So I wanted to go and do a little refresher there. And this video might be running a little long as a result because I want to start with theory and then go into examples. Uh, so that's where this game comes in. Since I'm going to be going over some theory, I thought I would go and just allow you guys to be entertained with uh, Shibano Toromaru, one of uh, Japan's strongest uh, pro players. He played online. I'll probably be throwing up random games on here while I'm uh, going on about some theory and then move on to actual specifics with games that are going on live currently, like on OGS or something. Just like you can find live games if you head over to baduk.club, smash that map button, and then wherever there is a little dot, there might be a club or there might be a go player in your area just waiting for you to smash them in person on the board. Got it. Landed it. Way to go me. Uh, as you can see in the Ohio area, there is going to be, go away, there is going to be the Midwest Open, March 12th and the 13th. I can see there are quite a few people and, and people whose uh, names I'm not going to click on because some of them have their phone number and that's probably not a good thing to put in the video. Uh, suffice it to say, yeah, there's people, there's clubs, there's events. You can know all these things at baduk.club. Go there and check it out if you haven't already done so. Thank you, as always, for them in part sponsoring these videos. All right, so the question of basics, like what are they? Um, I have been told they're just like my style of play, uh, but really it's not. It's really not just like a style of play. It's really more or less just understanding how the game is played. That's what basics are. That's what the fundamentals are, right? They're the foundation for understanding what's going on in the game and making sure you understand what's going on in the game. That way you can better make your decisions on where you want to play or where you're not going to play and what the cost of not playing there is. For example, what is Go? Go is essentially a game played by two players. Cool. Go is a game played by two players where each player plays one piece every turn. Cool. The ultimate goal of the game is to have more intersections surrounded than your opponent at the end of the game. Cool. So once we understand what the game is, we also have to understand that every turn we have to ideally make sure that we are going about trying to accomplish the goal of the game, which is having more territory at the end of it in the most efficient way possible. Makes sense so far, right? Which is why uh, there are concepts that we're going to be going over, such as finding the largest area of the board uh, to play on. Why do we want to do that? Because it makes sense that we go after the largest areas for the most profit first and not the smallest areas because then our opponent, who's also trying to win the game, remember, will then go and take the largest areas of the board for themselves and, and then we don't really know what exactly it is we've been accomplishing with our moves. Uh, they're inefficient, they're letting us down, and we're 
probably going to be in a bad way uh, at that point. So none of that is just, you know, my style or whatever. That's just the nature of the game. So cool. Once we understand that, we start losing things a little bit when we see people not doing that. And that comes to kind of like a double-edged sword of the basics. Because on one hand, we're going to be going over a lot of the things and a lot of ideas uh, that I'm going to be going over and why we're going to be going over them. But we're also kind of got to be on the flip side of that. And if we're taking the larger points and our opponent isn't, we can take advantage of them by taking those larger points for ourselves so we can get ahead. But this also has um, a, a little bit more aggressive kind of uh, thing to it, in which one thing we're also going to be doing is looking after our shape, and I'm going to be showing uh, that, uh, getting bases, things like that. But at the same time, if our opponent isn't getting a base, our, just like if our opponent isn't taking a large point of the board for themselves, then suddenly they become a target of opportunity. So basics can easily, easily translate into playing an aggressive game because we're going to be getting a better understanding of what's weak and what's strong, what's good shape, what's bad shape. And when we see our opponent making mistakes in that kind of area of the board, we're going to be able to pounce on them because we've been practicing good shape, we've been understanding why it's important to get bases, all of these sorts of things. So when we look at this for ourselves, we should also be aware, maybe not at the DDK level, but as we get stronger, as we're understanding how this applies to us more and more, then we'll start understanding how it applies to our opponent. And when they deviate, and when they don't do something, that gives us the opportunity to do something to take advantage of whatever it is they were supposed to do. Cool? Makes sense. Now, you might be saying to yourself, um, especially the, the people who are on the, like, it's just, it, it's just uh, your style of play crowd. You know, I watch, you know, insert player here. Or I play at insert rank here. And uh, they, they don't do anything like what you're describing. And there are actually uh, quite a few reasons why that might be. It might be, for example, especially at the amateur level, uh, it, it could just be careless. They're playing too fast. They're not really thinking their moves all the way through. So they might be playing on autopilot. And depending on how long they've been at a certain rank versus another rank, they might be playing a little bit lower than where they should be or whatever. Or maybe they just don't think about these things. And so meh. Or it could also be that they understand they're leaving a weakness behind. This tends to crop up a lot in um, some of the more aggressive Q players and a lot of the Don players, for example. They might understand they're leaving a weak point behind, but maybe they're hedging their bets that you're not going to be able to take advantage of it very well. Or they might be not playing in the largest area and they might be trying to provoke a fight because a lot of their opponents might take the bait, forget the large points, go for the fights immediately, and it just doesn't, it, it doesn't hurt them. Like, if you do something, you don't get called out on it, then there's no reason you don't really learn not to keep doing that, right? So there's a lot of reasons why you see people deviate from some of the things that we're going to be talking about, and you can deviate from some of the things we're talking about as well, just be aware that it will have a cost for doing so. Like, and again, easy example of that is if there's like a really large enclosure or a really large side that you can claim, but you're trying to get your opponent to fight over something else, well, if they get the sente and take the big thing, it was still a big thing, right? The, the fundamentals of Go didn't magically change just because you were trying to, you know, uh, poke a fight over something. If you're, if you're going to choose to leave whatever that is behind or choose not to defend whatever it is that was weak, then, yeah, if your opponent notices and goes after it, eh, it's on you. You knew better, you know? That's, that's a choice that you made. It's just a choice that you made. So... That's pretty much uh, what 
we're referring to when we talk about, you know, basics and things like that. We're just talking about essentially what your moves are saying. We're talking about identifying large points of the board, uh, defending ourselves, all this kind of good stuff. And let's give you some uh, wonderful little examples about that. T-Learn's game is over. This one, by the way, was uh, YKPCX. And if you want to find it, it's easily over uh, on Fox, YKPCX. You can look at the rest of this game if you got emotionally invested into it. So the first thing that we usually talk about, uh, because it's the first thing that occurs in the game, is how to open and uh, where we're going to play uh, our opening moves, right? Cool. Now, to do that, you have to understand the various nature of the game. And that is, again, we want to enclose more area of the board than our opponent. So we usually go corner, sides, and then center. And the reason we do that is because to enclose something, like if I wanted to enclose this section here in the middle of the board, then I would need one wall, two wall, three walls, and four walls, right? We need to enclose it on all sides. And it stands to reason that we would want to use the things that already exist on the board to our advantage to minimize the amount of work we have to do to accomplish our goal. So if we want to enclose an area, well, this is already a wall by virtue of the fact that it is the edge of the board. You can't go past it. Therefore, it is a wall we can't go past. Our opponents can't invade through it, and our opponents can't run past it. Therefore, it is a fact a wall. And we've also got, you know, walls here and here. Uh, hello? I didn't ask you to do that. Go away. So we have like a wall here and a wall here, as well as here and here, of course. But since we already have two walls on the, uh, on the board, it stands to reason we play in a corner first because we already have two walls helping us out with whatever it is that we're trying to do. In this case, probably just get more territory, right? So... We tend to open up focusing on corners because we have the two walls aiding us, then the sides because we have one wall aiding us, and then the center because there there are no walls aiding us, and we kind of have to build everything up there from scratch. So it's easiest to get territory because of things that already exist on the board. And this, again, is like basic, basic fundamental crap you probably have taught utter beginners, right? But th that's. That's why these things exist. So as we go through a game, it's understandable to see, like in this uh, DDK game that I've got up here, we've got a corner uh, play, a corner play, a corner, and a corner play. Great, because they've got the walls that are backing them up. This is the easiest place to establish a position because of said walls. So next we're going to do is we're probably going to contest those corners, right? So we have an approach on the corner because an enclosure is one of the easiest ways to get the territory in the beginning of the game because, again, of the said walls. Hard to invade with, uh, you know, walls already right there in place. So, great. Black's contesting and approaching. Stop doing that. So, so Black is contesting and approaching. White's kicking, which I'm just not going to get into right now. Suffice to say, answered the approach. Fantastic. This is where we would kind of say, okay, you got an idea that I was about to get into, which is we want to give our uh, stones bases in order to, you know, not be dead. Um, reason why we would want a base for our group is because in order for our stones and our groups not to be dead, they need eyes. So if we can't make eye shape, then we are screwed. So if you take this stone off the board, for example, and imagine a white stone there, then suddenly we know that we don't have any way for F17 to begin making I shape. There's just not enough room. Therefore, if it's not dead, it's just going to have to run a long, long, long time. And we don't really want to put that many stones on the board that aren't getting actual points because the goal of the game is to get points. So if we're not doing that, then typically we are losing. That's bad, by the way. That's bad. Now, regretfully, uh, they did violate a proverb. Uh, we do want to respond to the kick, uh, shoulder hits, and attachments by making our stones stronger. 
And only after that, for example, would we want to go and get ourselves a base because now we've got a little bit of a teeny tiny little wall here for ourselves and we've extended off a little teeny tiny wall. It's got our own little uh, sort of mound of strength here, kind of like resting on the board while we're expanding off uh, the upper right hand corner. So we want to play the corners first, corner side center. And we want to make sure that we do have bases. That's cool. But we also need to make sure that our stones aren't weak. So if we're kicked, shoulder hit, uh, attach to, see, kick, shoulder hit, attachment, or cap. That's another one. We, want, we usually want to respond to those because these are moves that are actively going to seek to make our stones weaker. So we want to respond to it to make sure they can't do that. So thus we have some general rules of thumb here. We play corner side center first. We kind of contest the corners and their attempts to get enclosures or what have you uh, before anything else. We want to make sure our stones are getting to live somehow, which is usually getting a base. And if during the course of like this opening stuff or pretty much throughout the rest of the game, if we get kicked, shoulder hit, attached, or capped, like anything that's going to be putting pressure to weaken our stones, we probably want to respond to it to make sure our stones stay nice and strong. Now here, again, in this DDK game, you can see that white played the Hane, black had to defend or lose the stone. Very, very sad. But now that's kind of like a three stone wall here as we kind of got rocking for white. So we could easily start saying, you know what, this is turning into some influence. So I can continue doing this kind of thing, or I could try to go for a huge framework by noting I'm getting a lot of influence. But that's pretty much what we want to do. We want to either contest the corner still, contest the corner still, develop the corner before it can be contested, or maybe go for a framework if we've got a reason to do so, or we just feel like doing it. These are the kind of things we want to do. So when we see White's next move here, it's like, hmm, that's not anything that I just said on my radar. What is White really trying to do? Well, White's, we can generally, unless your reading can take you past this, if they aren't doing one of those things that we just went over, they're probably making a little bit of a mistake. Yeah, this area is getting a little bit stronger, but is that stone really worth giving away an enclosure? Is that stone really worth allowing a free approach by black? Probably not. Probably not. So, okay. They made a slow move. Now black gets to make a larger move. Continuing, or at least fixing the mistake that we had here and starting to maybe pull ahead again. That would be really, really great. Notice here, however, black didn't do that. Hmm, interesting. This right here looks like it's being played really, really close to these stones. That means, great, there must be an attack going on there. But there's literally an eye here and there's plenty of spaces here, so there can't be an attack on a group that is absolutely freaking immortal. So as white, I could say, that's not doing anything. There's corner enclosures that I could go and contest. There's corner enclosures I can take for myself. There's like sides that are still open. A lot of stuff I can do. So I could go about my merry little way doing one of those things that I have already just mentioned and that I know from, you know, basic rule of thumb here that should be big for me. Now, an aggressive idea would be to say, this is influence, this is too close, I'm going to attack it. The danger there, however, is if the light goes on in your opponent's head again, and they're like, wait, that was way too early to do that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be trying to attack that there. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and start doing what I should have done and I'm going to take those big moves again. Could, could easily do that. And then you've got to decide, because you invested in an attack this early in the game, 
Like, are you gonna double down on that? Are you gonna just go about your merry way again? And then double down on that? And if they don't respond, are you gonna make sure it's dead? And if you're doing that, how much of the ter- how much of the board are you getting rid of? Because while you're playing sides now, Black remembered to do corners first, and suddenly we've got very different positions on the board. Because they went back into corners before sides in center mode, whereas we're doubling down on just like the uh, one side that we have here. So it could be a little bit of a problem, right? Anytime there are those large points on the board and you're opting not to take them, you are allowing your opponent to consider doing that instead. Not saying attacking this is wrong, it just comes with a cost of not taking a, one of those large moves that we were uh, referring to. So the opponent attached, and again, as per basics, we want to make this stone stronger. Rather, it's going to simply be a, something as simple as playing the Hane, or the back off, or maybe, maybe the one space jump. Okay, great, we're defending ourselves. Here we can see the defense going on for black. White's kind of trying to do something. And white's trying to do something else over here. What? I don't know. It looks like it's trying to contest the corner. Okay. But think about what we've just done here. We've just attached to our opponent's move. And now it's their turn. Think about that another way. Think about that another way. Let's say, hypothetically, Hypothetically, in the mid game or something, let's say that you were the one. Let's say that you were the one here as, I don't know, maybe as black. And we took an enclosure. And your opponent attached to you. Would you play away right now? Because we know from basic ideas. Any stone played to make our stones weaker is probably something that we want to respond to if we don't already have assured life. So that's your attachments, your shoulder hits, your caps. And I'm forgetting one again. Attachments? Yeah. Shoulder hits? Uh-huh. Your caps, and there's a fourth one that is escaping me for whatever reason. <laughs> Either way, you probably know what it is. You know what I'm referring to, right? This is a move that is seeking to do that. It's seeking to make our stone weaker. We wouldn't respond to it. Or we wouldn't uh, not respond to it. We would absolutely want to take advantage of whatever it is our opponent was just trying to do to us. So if we fast forward here to what White just did, this is kind of like you having the 3-3, three, three, Black attached to you, and you did something else so they get to follow up. It doesn't really make a lot of a lot of sense, does it? It's like why why would you do that? Answer, you wouldn't because you're going to be behind now. So very very weird idea here and should absolutely be contesting in the more traditional fashion where we just approach maybe hot or low or if you know certain Jaseki maybe even two space, you know, whatever it is, we should be going off and doing that and not this weird attachment kind of thingy. And again, we're just using basic principles to get there. Basic principles. Playing away, basic principle is a proverb. Dahane had a two and three stones, so we would absolutely be playing this. And then we could either double Hane if we wanted to, or we could just go ahead and extend. Don't let them haunt it at a two and three stones. So we extend to four at the very least. And because we did this, we just uh, bumbled our way into a Jiseki, knowing nothing more than a proverb uh, to haunt at the head of two and three stones, or to not let your opponent haunt ideally at the head of two and three stones. That proverb takes us to here. 
finding ourselves able to create Jaseki on the fly. Instead, our opponent got a base, which is great. That's what we want to do up at the top of the board. We mentioned it. We want to make sure that our zones are able to go ahead and have enough eye space to not be dead. This is seeking to get eye space to not be dead. Unfortunately, by doing that, we are violating uh, a shape principle, which is to not let your opponent hunt it out of two and three stones because we tend to get like in this really over concentrated shape thingy while our opponent is making absolute uh, god level amounts of territory by poking at our bad shape and hunting at the head of two and three stones. So that is where we start seeing shape come into play. And we want to make sure that our stones are nice and strong and not giving us potentially bad shape later on, as we can clearly, clearly see here. This is weird, but we'll allow it. This, is it the largest part of the board? Let's look. One, two, three, four. Okay, this group is alive and we're contesting four lines of the board. Is there anywhere on the, else on this board that is worth more than four lines? If, it, if there is, that's probably where we want to play. Well, let's take a look. Uh, this one is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven lines, and one, two, three, four, five, six lines. So it seems that this is largest, this is second largest, this is third largest, and this is the absolute fourth largest. And now here is where things get difficult because. Yes, numerically, there are more lines than on, on some parts of the board than others. But then we have to ask ourselves, do any of these sides give us extra value? And by that, we're looking at uh, is one of these sides helping a weak group? Is one of these sides connecting weak groups? Is one of these sides preventing our opponent from expanding and creating more of their points? Things along those lines. And here we can say, well, we've got a group here. And if we play on top, we're kind of trying to connect the top. And we're making it really, really tough for our opponent to jump into this tiny one, two, three, four line area and create difficulty for us. We can also play on the right since it's larger, but we know there's a larger move to do it because of shape. Han ahead of two and three stones. So if we're going to play here, we'd probably play here instead for shape reasons. Or we're going to play here for, uh, to kind of connect up and because it's a big area of the board. The one on the left, we're already alive. It's kind of tiny. There's very uh, little reason to play it. Kind of the same thing over here. If we play all the way over here, we're leaving like these weaknesses behind. And now maybe both of our groups are not as strong as they could be. Because maybe they're between, you know, two white areas. Could be a little uncomfortable. We could play here, not leaving the weaknesses behind. So our opponent, who's got a strong corner, can't just counterattack and put pressure on us. But now we just took up two lines. That's that's smaller than even this one was. So we can look at the board in this manner and begin to decide where the largest point is based on which side has the most lines, where we can feasibly play to try to take uh, some, some of those lines for ourselves. And if we're aiding anything weak or by the flip side of that, pressuring anything of our opponents that's weak. So that's how we come up with almost any other move besides this one, just using the basic as the principales. This move is not sente. I expect white to play away right now. He does not. Very, very unfortunate for him. Did respond. Mm, kept the corner, but this is pretty big. Like I mentioned, this is pretty big. Like I mentioned, and there's still plenty, plenty, plenty of room down here to expand if for whatever reason these stones get in trouble. 
So there are a kind of more interesting things to do on the board. Here, we're trying to attack, but remember, shape, our opponent can get some more of it to get very, very big. And now since this is radiating influence, holy crap, we're too close to this, aren't we? So we're getting one, two, three, four lines again for white, but oh, we're not really able to attack it because black is just gonna get amazing shape and already has a fantastic base. I mean, heck, black might even be able to just pincer it flat out. I think this area with the base is stronger than this one with no base. And so we're in trouble there as well. Probably better to have instead taken advantage of the shape here or contest the big enclosure here that seeks to maybe connect up the top of the board. See how easy it is to kind of find these moves? See how easy that is? And you could also see how easy it is to avoid moves like this when we're just asking ourselves some pretty cool basic shape questions on this board. Like we would never think to play here and make our opponent stronger. Why are we doing that? In fact, in this one, we're even leaving a shape weakness behind because our opponent can go underneath maybe and connect. And if we drop down, Ah, that Hane is going to hurt us again, so I guess we're going to leave. But there's still that Hane, and now there's like a, a Hane over this one. Like everything here is just kind of collapsing into a complicated mess because we left that little weird weak point behind, right? And instead of connecting and thus getting rid of all of our territory, we tried to fight it, got split into multiple weak groups, and now bad things are happening. So, quick recap this to uh, this point so far. We're playing in the corners first because we got those walls backing us up, and it's easier to it's most easy to make a uh, territory there before doing the side where we have one wall to back us up, center where we have no walls to back us up. Then we're going to try to contest those corners. Then we're going to, you know, contest the sides. Then we're going to contest the uh, middle. How do we find? where the largest points of the board are. Usually it's whichever side has the uh, largest amount of lines on it, right? That, that's how we're going to identify moves, such as whether we're playing this one and contesting like the two or the three here versus this one, which is the entire top side. We're also going to be wary while we're doing this. I'm not creating bad shape. So we're going to be hyper aware and make sure that our little uh, walls that we create, these little tiny two and three wall little duders are going to be able to get extensions off their off their wall and get a base. Or we're going to hane at the head of two and three stones. You can double hane at the head of them. Or you can just extend and then not let your opponent hane at head of two and three before you can go off and do other things. That way we are not going to be uh, unfortunately having very, very bad shape on our hands. When our opponent is deviating off of the things that we've talked about so far, we're not really going to stress it. We're just going to look for the next large thing that we can do according to those lovely little principles. And we're going to simply play that way and allow our opponent to tell us what in the blazes this is all about. And we're not going to just fret. It's going to be up to them, not on to us. If we do wind up deciding to make attacks early on in the game, we're going to do so knowing full well it's at the cost of our opponent at any moment deciding to go back and take a large move away from us or maybe a large move for themselves. So if we are attacking, hopefully that move is going to be worth uh, the enclosure, for example, this early on in the game. Or if there's already an enclosure, um, ignore that. Or if there's already an enclosure, making sure that it's worth allowing our opponent to get like an extension at the cost of that attack, because we understand the importance of corner side center. And if we're deviating, we understand the value we're giving up in exchange for the attack that we're about to try to uh, undertake. 
So hopefully all of this is making the sense so far. Now, continuing to speak more about shape, we are going to be hyper aware of really, really silly things like, hey, I'm going to attach to my opponent for no reason on their turn, which means they get to attack and harass me. Oops, that bait might be a good idea. And also, just along that similar vein, we see Black committing the same mistake that White did here, where, hey, we are going to put one lone stone on a group with more liberties than we have on our opponent's turn now, so they get to lower us to two liberties, depending on how they want to respond. Like, how is that going to be advantageous for us if we're literally creating weak stones? Like, maybe we shouldn't be doing that, and instead of creating a brand new stone, maybe we can aid the ones that we already have on the board, right? That way we're strengthening what we have and we're not leaving all these little weirdo weaknesses behind. Also, because they were separated, you can see multiple cutting points being taken advantage of now. And now things are getting complicated again. They're getting complicated because of what we did here. This wasn't connected to anything. It tried to do something it couldn't, creating multiple weak uh, cutting points that White can now just take advantage of. Just how it goes. Just how it goes. Kind of like a shoulder hit kind of thing, but we already mentioned it's better to do this because, again, imagine this stone is white initially and black approaches it like here. Would white go away right now? Probably not, right? Probably not. So it's a weird position to be in. Weird position to be in indeed. So this stone is just being hurt. Should have put at the corner. As you know, corner before, side and center. And now we've got a uh, little bit of a break here. If white responds and black connects, then white gets to double honate the head of two and three stones. Once again, we're kind of in that whole oops, the proverbs coming back to haunt us territory. Not fun. This, no reason to have played it. High head of two and three, really, really fantastic. There you go. Mm, Could have gone double because this is already alive. Then we can fix our little cutting point. We've got nice strong shape here and look at what's happening to these three stones. Cut off all by themselves. Very, very, very sad. And now they're getting in trouble because they're between two strong groups. Very unfortunate. White's playing away. Being aware of the, the, the influences coming here. Probably doesn't want black to extend from it and take like all the things for themselves. I can I can understand that and I can give that a nod. But then you lose me on the attachment again because we've done that like three or four times now in this game. Not really making sense. Gotta be careful of uh, attachments like this. Like why are we doing it? What are we actually accomplishing? Because we're just telling our opponent to hurt the stone with few liberties in the best way that is available to them. Right? Nick and Hani on the inside to put us to two liberties. Like, like wherever. This side, this side, which, which side hurts, which side hurts me the most and helps you the best. Like, you, you can get, you get to play that way. And we don't want our opponents to play that way because they're probably going to play in the way that gives them the most obvious chance to win the game they're trying to win. We don't want to do that. We don't want to give them things like that. Jumping away, mistake. Extending for more liberties. Or playing the Hane to reduce liberties. Much better than this, which is going to, again, now he gets to Hane. Or he gets to push. Or he gets to Hane. Who knows? Whatever is best for Black, Black now gets to do. Now, as it stands, we'll never get to know how this game actually is going to end because they ended on timeout. 
And I can also see by the clock on my screen that this has already gone over about a half an hour. So I think this is a nice introduction to basics and has begun to poke our head into the mid game, which will also be its own video. Uh, so coming up next couple of weeks from now, depending on when you watch this video, could already be up on my channel, we're going to look at more mid-game practices such as putting pressure on a group, not necessarily to kill it, but just to profit from it. If they ignore it, it's going to come at a cost though. And we're going to identify how we can identify the pressure that we can apply, where to apply that pressure, how to look at a group that can be pressured, all, all of that good stuff, ways to attack for profit, ways to follow up if we're trying to attack for profit and our opponent is ignoring us, all of those wonderful, wonderful, good mid-game strategies. And while we're doing this, of course, we're going to try to avoid creating um, unpleasant shape that would come back and uh, bite us. But I think this is a good introduction for opening basics. Hope you join me next time for mid-game basics. And if you had any questions about the opening, uh, I hope this maybe cleared a few of them up for you. So until next time, take care, everybody.